Okay, I think we're ready to go. So welcome again, and thank you for joining us today as we discuss measuring what matters, putting OKRs into practice. Now, for those of you joining us who are familiar with implementing OKRs, you'll have most likely experienced that while this approach or philosophy makes a lot of sense conceptually, when the rubber hits the road, so to speak, this is where we often see the wheels come off and they can be a little bit tricky to implement. So hopefully today during the course of our time together, we'll be able to provide you with some concrete, some tangible starting points uh, if you're thinking of implementing or even iterating your approach anytime soon. Uh, before we delve into this, however, and by way of introduction, I'm Libby Stewart, Head of Professional Services and Research at Seven Geese. Uh, and in case you haven't heard of us before, Seven Geese is a continuous performance management technology company. Um, so we partner with companies all over the world to elevate their performance culture. And we do this through goal setting, such as OKRs, uh, continuous conversations via one-on-ones, recognitions and feedback, just to name a few initiatives. Um, and actually one of our key features of our software is the ability for companies to track and align their OKRs, uh, really allowing them to unleash the power of this approach with transparency and visibility. So as head of professional services at Seven Geese, um, I actually specialize in behavioral science. I have a background in organizational psychology, human resources, and strategic organizational development. Um, and this is why I'm lucky enough to partner with all of our clients globally to implement their performance management initiatives. I'm personally really excited about OKRs. I think they're a fantastic approach in terms of um, helping companies elevate and execute on their strategy. I'm so glad and excited today to be partnering with Felipe Castro. Um, so Felipe is a master goal hacker and a true expert in the field of OKRs. Uh, Felipe has partnered with hundreds of clients globally as well to implement their OKR processes and take them to the next level in terms of performance. Um, so welcome Felipe, we're so glad that you could join us today. Hi Levi, thanks a lot for, for having me. Not a problem. So, so, um, so look, in, talk in terms of Sorry. So if we go to, to, to the agenda for today, right? Absolutely. So in terms of our agenda, um, so Felipe, uh, when we first connected about hosting the session today, um, I think actually one of the first things that we connected over was our shared experience uh, of clients that would tell us that had read the book Measure What Matters uh, by John Doa. Um, and they'd found the stories within the book really enjoyable. They found the OKR philosophy well explained. Um, however, some of those more practical aspects of application and implementation weren't all that apparent or clear. Um, or not clear enough to sort of start their implementation alone. Uh, so based on this and based on our conversation, we decided we would uh, overview some key areas today. Uh, so first, uh, I'm going to throw to Felipe to uh, uh, cover the good, the bad and the ugly when it comes to Measure What Matters by John Doa. Um, and then we're going to get Felipe to talk us through some of the common mistakes that he's witnessed with OKRs, uh, discuss the OKR cycle, flesh out how to implement OKRs effectively, and we're gonna leave some time at the end, so hopefully about 20 minutes, uh, to address any questions raised along the way. Uh, so as we go along, please feel free to input your questions. We'll pull these for the end and, and engage in a bit more of a discussion there. Um, but over to you, Felipe, with Measure What Matters, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Okay, thank you, Libby. So uh, Measure What Matters by, by John Doerr is uh, a book about OKRs who became a New York Times bestseller, right? The book uh, came out in, in uh, early this year and it really took off and really helped uh, promote uh, everything about, about OKR, right? The, the level of interest really, really took off and uh, as a, an OKR coach, when I go to talk to uh, companies all around the world, many, many people have read the book and, and so, uh, we're here to talk about what's good in the book, what's bad, what's ugly, and so because the book can cause several uh, several challenges for 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 uh, the readers. So we want to cover that in order to be able to to help you actually implement OKR, right? So uh, the first thing I, I need to to highlight is that I'm 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 a huge Don Door fan. In fact, I like to say that I'm I'm a front row seat fan, right? Because this is a picture I took. Uh, the first time I actually got to see Dor uh, speak uh, a few years ago, and you can see I'm in the front row, right? And so every time I, I get a chance to, to watch uh, Dor speak, I, I'm, I'm in the front row. Uh, I'm a huge fan, a uh, uh, huge admirer of his work. Uh, John Dor, for those of you who are not familiar, he's considered to be the Michael Jordan of venture capitalists, 
capitalism, because he, he was an early investor both in Google and Amazon, right? So he's an extremely successful uh, individual. And he introduced uh, OKRs to several of uh, his portfolio companies, including Google, right? So he, 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 he provides a perspective from uh, the board uh, room from OKRs, which is amazing, right? So, uh, but having said that, uh, you need to take the, bo the book with a few dashes of salt, right? Uh, the stories are fantastic. There's lots and lots of good material uh, 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 around uh, OKR in the book. Uh, I highly recommend it to read the book, but you have to, to read the book and take it with a few uh, dashes of salt, right? Because um, I, I really hope that Dor is able to, to uh, come up with a second edition of the book where he, he, he uh, fixes some of the, 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 the problems in the book. Because the book overall is a very good read. Right, and it shows the the, the philosophy and the, the underlying uh, logic of OKR, but we need to take it with a few dots of salt. Can it can be misleading? Right. So the fact is, as I said, Measurable Matters has lots of good stuff in it. Right. First of all, the the book brings great stories, first person stories from the CEOs of Google and YouTube. Right. And I think Dor is the only person who can actually get the CEOs of both Google and YouTube to write about OKR for his book, right? Uh, do, the book also uh, uh, provides uh, Google's internal OKR playbook, so part of the material that Google uses to train their own employees on OKR, which adds uh, lots of good tips, right? Uh, and also one, thing that, one of the things that I love about the book is that the book reinforces the need for bi-directional goal setting. So it reinforces the fact that OKR is not cascaded 100% top down. There's a bi-directional conversation, right? So uh, in Doors' uh, words, and I'm quoting from the book here, uh, high functioning teams thrive on a creative tension between top down and bottom up goal setting. So the idea is that there's a back and forth. It's not 100% top down, but it's not 100% bottoms up either. The idea is this tension, this back and forth, is what really creates alignment, really uh, drives high performance, and, and provides the teams with all the context and the, the autonomy that they need to perform, right? So, so the book has lots of good stuff. Uh, Door also, also covers uh, one very uh, common question about, around OKR, because uh, he introduces two types of OKRs. Aspirational OKRs and committed OKRs. Aspirational OKRs is uh, what you're used to reading about OKR. Oh, we're going to set uh, more ambitious targets may, that maybe you don't need to reach 100% of that. But it also talks about committed OKRs, which is when you need to keep the trains running on time. Things where I need more predictability, things like revenue, SLAs, etc. So that uh, is a great thing. Uh, uh, I've been talking about that for, for, for a few years now, and it's great to see Door uh, coming up with, with terms and explaining the difference, because yes, you can use uh, OKRs also to, to manage more predictable work, things where you need to commit to a target, right? So that's uh, great. Uh, and also one of the things, uh, I love this expression, he, he explains that OKR and compensation, they, there's an amicable divorce between OKR and compensation, meaning they're still friends, but they're, they're not married anymore. So the book talks a little bit about how to deal with OKR and compensation. That's another uh, major contribution from the book, okay? So as I said, the measure of matters has lots and lots of good stuff in it, right? And I recommend that you read it if you haven't read it, okay? uh, But the fact is, although the theory in the book is, is great, Many of the examples are very bad. They're terrible. And I said, I really wish that the work could come up with a, a second edition of the book that changes, especially uh, uh, the examples, right? Because the examples uh, uh, can really be misleading, right? And I, I see that the examples, some of the examples represent many of the most common OKR mistakes that I see uh, as an OKR coach. So. For this part of the, 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 the webinar, I'm going to go through the most common OKR mistakes, 
right? And I'm going to try to explain those mistakes by using some examples from the book and also using some good examples of the book so you can compare and contrast uh, uh, what are good examples of OKRs and bad examples of OKRs, right? So what are the most common uh, OKR mistakes? And I'm going to leave the most common one for last, okay? So let's talk a little bit about some of the most common OKR mistakes. So, well, you're doing it OKRs wrong if, if you have to stop to catch your breath while reading your objective. If your objective is so long that you have to stop while reading that to catch your breath, you're doing it absolutely wrong, right? So here's one example of the book, right? And I definitely need to read it. Uh, Proactively integrate a broad range of African perspectives into one's work, align more closely with African priorities, and share and leverage one's political capital to achieve. And I definitely lost my breath there, right? So it's impossible for anyone in organization to actually remember that. So OKR is not a mission statement, right? OKR has to be short and memorable, right? So this is you're definitely doing it wrong if you have to to stop to catch your breath right so let's go over some uh, examples of good objectives and again those are from the book as well right so here's a great uh okr from google a great objective from google in 2008 make the web as fast as flipping to a magazine so the image of someone flipping to a magazine was something that uh Google employees could relate to and understand. And in 2008, it was really important to make the web faster. So what? how can Google contribute to that? So that's an objective that can be aspirational and rally the troops, and, and everybody can align around that, right? Uh, a second example of object, again, from the book, is that delight customers. It's simple, it's concise, everybody can understand it. And what's important for you to understand is in both examples, you can see that uh, those objectives are not something that you're going to uh, achieve in a quarter. So sometimes you can use the objective as a longer term vision, something you're going to want to achieve quarter after quarter. And the key results are just how you're going to measure if you're moving towards that objective. Okay. So in that sense, the light our customers is something that you probably always want to do. And you can even roll over and reuse that, that same objective in the next quarter if you want to, okay? Uh, another good objective, again, a good example from the book, help more people around the world. So again, it's something that's aspirational, people can understand it, people can remember it. So those are examples of good objectives. Another type of mistake, again, you're doing it wrong if, if you don't know how you're going to track your key results. If after you write your key result, you leave, you left wondering, hey, how am I going to actually track that? You're definitely doing it wrong. Okay, so let's cover some examples of non-measurable key results, right? Which is a very common mistake. Uh, focus on hiring a player managers leaders. How are we going to measure that? Right. Another example would be ensure ongoing mentoring slash coaching opportunities. Again, people can uh, uh, agree to that, but how are you going to measure it? And finally, create a culture of learning for development, new and existing employees. Those uh, key results are what you usually call uh, an intent. An intent is a, a qualitative subjective phrase that everybody can, agrees with, can agree with but since it's not measurable, it creates misalignment because each person in the organization may have a different interpretation of what it means, so they're going to go into different directions. So if you, it's very hard to not agree to, oh, we need to create a culture of, of learning. Of course we need to create a culture of learning, but how are we going to measure if it's working? That's what OKR is about, having those conversations around how we're going to measure if it's working, how are we going to measure if we're adding value, right? So be very careful when writing those examples of key results. Again, those all come from the book, so they, the book can be misleading in the examples. 
And I definitely uh, have to write like the first one kind of it's kind of intriguing because it's like your key result is not about hiring a player, but it's about focusing on hiring a player. So it's it's even can case even more confusing because we don't need it's like you don't have to hire a player, you just have to focus on that really hard. Right. So be careful when writing those things. Have the, the a conversation around how we're going to measure it, what's the best way to, to measure if it's working, how can we measure if we're delivering value. That's the core of OKR. Okay, so be careful about making this mistake of writing non-measurable key results. Okay? So fundamentally, key results are measurable. Key results are how you keep score. They, it's how you know if you're winning the game. It's how you know if you're succeeding. So that's why they exist, right? So be very careful on writing uh, non-measurable uh, key results, okay? Again, another type of mistakes. Uh, you're doing it wrong if you have way too many OKRs, right? I've seen uh, some uh, advice online where people say, oh, you can have up to six objectives, each with four to six uh, key results. So if you do the math, if I have up to six objectives with six key, six key results, it means you have 36 key results. Well, a quarter has 12 weeks, so it basically means you have to deliver on three key results per week. That's impossible, right? So if you have too many OKRs, you're doing it wrong. Because uh, if everything is a priority, nothing is. So OKR is about focusing. It's about having that hard conversation about what really matters and making this distinction and learning to say no. OKR means you have to say, learn to say no a lot. So if you have two things, OKR is about saying, A, this thing A is more important than this other thing B, so I'm going to do A this quarter. B is for next quarter. We're going to talk about it again. Maybe I, don't, I won't be able to do B again. Because B is not my priority. So OKR is about being focused, learning to say no, and, and not doing what's not a priority, right? So you have to learn to say no. Another type of mistake, you're doing it wrong if, if you're creating OKRs in silos. That's a very uh, common uh, OKR mistake. People create OKRs in silos without talking to each other, right? And then of course you fail because OKR is by itself basically an alignment tool. And if you're not using it to align, you're kind of missing the point, right? Uh, when you create OKRs in silos, uh, you tend to create what we call the tunnel and bridge problem. The tunnel and bridge problem is uh, masterful, masterfully uh, illustrated by this cartoon from Henry Nieber. Henry Nieber works at Spotify. He's a master, one of the best uh, agile coaches in the world. And he has this great cartoon about misalignment where we have uh, the team on the left is uh, building a bridge and the team on the right is building a tunnel. If you think about it, both teams are trying to reach the same outcome, which is to reduce the time to cross the river. But since they don't talk to each other, they end up with conflicting initiatives, right? And what I lo love about this cartoon is the tunnel team continues to dig. They're going to run over the, the foundation of the bridge. If the bridge will be destroyed, everybody will die. It's going to be a disaster. So we can solve things like that. Usually, if you have a 10-minute conversation between the two teams in the beginning of the quarter, before they start working, a 10-minute conversation can solve that. So that's OKR. OKR is about lightweight, structured conversations to create alignment. So you have to go out of your silos to create uh, uh, alignment and avoid the tunnel and bridge problem, right? So if you create OKRs in silos, uh, what happens is teams won't align, you end up with conflicting OKRs, you end up with local optimization and poor results. So be very careful about this mistake of creating OKRs in silos. That's very, very common, and that's exactly the problem that OKR was created to solve, so try to be very careful about that. Another type of mistake, 
you're doing it wrong if if you're treating OKRs as new weird resolutions. That's a very common mistake. People throw a big party, hey, we're doing OKRs, hey, amazing, cool, we're just like Google. And they, they don't track the OKRs, right? So the fact is, unless you track your, your OKRs, unless you have followed through, OKRs will turn into a list of neglected and unachieved goals. If you treat your OKRs as new year resolutions, you get the same results you get from new year resolutions, which is none whatsoever, right? So it's very important to have a regular check-ins for tracking your OKRs. Uh, I recommend, strongly recommend you try it weekly. Uh, some of my clients, they prefer to do every other week, but track them regularly. That's crucial, right? And that's very important uh, to highlight that uh, measure matters highlights uh, and reinforce the importance of tracking OKRs, right? And uh, quoting from the book again, uh, Dor writes that without fre frequent status updates, goals slide into irrelevance. At quarter's end of worse, at year's end, we're left with zombie OKRs on paper, what's and how's the void of life of meaning, right? So unless you make them real and make them concrete, uh, you won't get any results, right? So that's very uh, uh, important that you have those freaking check-ins to track OKRs and course correct to ensure that you're actually achieving your OKRs. And finally, the most common OKR mistake is by far using OKR as a total list. That's by far the most common uh, OKR mistake. I see it every single company that I work with. Uh, it's just the way our brain works, right? So we have to be very careful to avoid that one. Um, the question I always ask is, if you deliver all your tasks and nothing improves, are you successful? I hope you agree you're not, right? Because in fact, we have evidence, we have lots of data that shows that most ideas fail. You may feel that your idea is brilliant, it's going to solve the problem, but data shows otherwise. Data shows that most ideas fail to achieve their desired outcomes. In fact, we have a great article from uh, Harvard Business Review from last year. Uh, it shows data from Google, from Microsoft, and it's also, uh, is also uh, aligned with data from Netflix, Booking.com, Etsy. So it's consistent with several other data sets, right? And what uh, the article shows is that most ideas fail, okay? So usually uh, one third of ideas uh, generates positive results. One third of ideas generates no results, meaning the metrics don't change. And finally, one third of ideas generates negative results, meaning instead of improving your numbers, it may, that, that category of ideas makes your metrics go worse, right? So uh, think about that. Only one third of ideas actually move the needle in the right direction, so, right? And that is why you can't focus on activities alone, right? So you have to learn how to manage two separate buckets, right? In the first bucket, you're going to put your OKRs. You're going to put the outcomes you want to achieve, right? And in the second bucket, you're going to put list your activities, the things you are going to do to improve your OKRs, right? So you have to learn how to manage both buckets, okay? Both buckets are important because unless you get things done, your OKRs won't improve, right? But at the end, the second bucket represents many ideas. I mean, most of them will fail anyway. So you have to be ready to iterate and experiment and try new things until you actually achieve your OKRs. So you have to learn to make this clear distinction between OKRs and activities, and you have to learn how to manage both buckets. Most companies, they only manage the second bucket. They have a project mind, mindset, right? Where they just manage the, the, the activities. We have to learn to manage both and quickly iterate on our activities, right? And 
So here is an example of an OKR and some activities, right? Uh, an example of an OKR could be, an objective could be create an awesome customer experience. Yes, your objective can list words such as awesome. Yeah, they don't have to be boring. And you can list some key results to actually measure if you're delivering that awesome customer experience. So in this example, it could be, oh, we're going to improve the net score. So we're going to uh, ensure that our customers are recommending our product to their friends. We're going to also make sure that our customers buy again from us. So we're going to increase the repurchase rate. And we're going to do that while maintaining a certain customer acquisition cost. Because we don't want to spend a ton of money to make our, our customers uh, satisfied. We want to work smarter and don't nearly spend a ton of money. So what could be examples of activities for that OKR? Well, in the second bucket, we could have ideas such as, oh, we're going to launch a new product feature, or maybe we could, we're going to launch a new project. Oh, we're going to redesign the customer journey. We're going to run three new experiments. And we also need to develop a new metric. Those are all, all activities. They're, they're means to an end, right? If you launch a feature and that feature doesn't move the needle, you haven't succeeded. If you redesign the customer journey, you haven't and it doesn't move the needle, you haven't succeeded. So we don't want to redesign the customer journey. We want to, the, with the benefits and the value of redesigning the customer journey, right? So manage both buckets and most of the things in the activities buckets are just ideas. You're going to iterate quickly, test them, uh, test them, iterate, test new ones, have new ideas, etc. So quickly iterate and discard ID activities that do not move the needle, right? So we have to, to follow uh, my friend and colleague, Christina Woodkey, uh, advice that key results must be results. It seems obvious after you read it, but it's very important nonetheless, because as I said, the most common mistake in OKR is using OKR as a to-do list. So remember, key results are about results, are about the outcomes you want to achieve. Right? So a very common mistake is to list activities as key results. Right? So here's, here's some examples uh, from activities as key results. Uh, implement the PayPal integration. Complete blue jeans rollout to final user by the end of the quarter. Deliver functional data marks for HR and sales. Develop sales training materials for the field force. All those examples come from the book again, right? So that's what I say that the examples are, are, are bad. Uh, they can mislead the, the, the reader into believing that OKR is, a, is an activity tracking tool, and it's not. And I truly believe that that's not the message that, that uh, door intended to to deliver with the book. Door is a highly data driven, metric driven individual. We know that from his all his life work. So that's one point of the book can be misleading. So be careful about that. Right. So we have this great uh, advice from uh, Marissa Meyer. Uh, she's the uh, first female engineer at Google. Went on to be uh, Google's vice president and then uh, CEO of Yahoo. So Marissa has this great uh, uh, advice. Uh, it's not a key result unless it has a number. Right? So that's great advice. The book mentions that advice as well. right? But unfortunately, some of the examples do not follow uh, the advice. So uh, Marissa Maya's advice is a, a great way to spot an activity or at least something that is uh, not a proper key result, something that you, a key result that needs to be improved. right? So very easy, uh, uh, very simple tip. It has to have a number to be a good key result, right? But be careful because that's not enough, right? Uh, sometimes when I say, oh, uh, your key result has to have a number, people start doing things like that, right? They write things like deliver 100% of my tasks. Believe me, I've seen that. Or they write things such as, Increase the number of items delivered from X to Y. Hey, has a number. Or publish five articles. I don't want the five articles. I want the benefits and the value of writing the article. Why are you writing the articles in the first place? It's because you want people to read it, to engage with it, to use it, 
uh, to buy whatever is the, the reason and the why you're doing that, you have to talk about the value and the outcomes. Again, I don't want the, the five articles, I want the benefit of the five articles. So a key result has to have a number, but that's not enough, okay? So uh, be careful around that. Another common one, define and measure three new UX metrics. Very common mistake. Uh, defining new, new, new metrics is an activity that will improve your OKRs for next quarter. You're able to, to measure more stuff, but that's not a, a goal in itself. That's a means to an end, right? Treat it as an activity and focus on what you can measure now. So let's show some examples of good key results. Uh, reach 8 million total registered users. Yeah, that's a good example. Increase mobile monthly active users, MAUs, to 150K, another good example. 75% of customers prefer our product to the competitors in a blind test test. Again, good thing. We're using the blind test test as a way to see if our, our product is better than the competition, right? Order rating or 5.6 or 5 or better. Those are good examples, again, all from the book. So again, the book has also has a good example of OKR, right? Uh, those examples are good, but we can do better, right? We can improve them. How can we improve those examples? Well, there's a better format to writing our OKRs, which is try to use the from X to Y format, right? Let's see how those examples in the last slide can be written in the from X to Y format. Increase mobile monthly active users from X to 150K. Think about that. Unless I have this from X, I don't know where we stand. Is 150,000 a lot? Is it too little? Is it, are we talking about going from zero to 150 or we are at 145 and we want to go to 150, which is probably not ambitious enough, right? So, the from X to Y format forces you to know where you stand and where you're going to. A uh, uh, better way to write the second uh, key result would be increase the percentage of customers that prefer our product to the competitions in a blind test test from X to 75%. Again, unless I have this from X, unless I have the baseline, how do I know if 75% is ambitious enough? Maybe I'm already at 73 or maybe I'm at five and 75 is impossible. So set the base, you have that baseline and write OKRs using the from X to Y form. Again, include the order rating from X to 46 or 4.7. Forces you to measure it once, forces you to set the baseline and to know if, it, if it's hard enough, if it's ambitious enough, right? So moving forward here, how can we be successful with OKR? How can we avoid making all those, those mistakes? Uh, I created the OKR cycle. It's a tool that you can use every quarter to avoid the most common OKR mistakes. The OKR cycle is based on my experience training thousands of individuals around the world, and it has just three steps. The idea is you go through those three steps every quarter. Set, align, and achieve. At a very high level, the idea is that you set OKRs by focusing on the outcomes you want to achieve. Then you align the organization, you align the other teams, the other parties inside the organization around the outcomes you want to achieve. You ensure that everybody is working to, toward the same outcomes. And finally, you work to achieve those outcomes, those OKRs, by maintaining a cadence for tracking your OKRs. You regularly track them, you regularly course correct your activities, and you're sure you're actually achieving your OKRs. Okay. If you want to know more about the OKR cycle, go to philippecasho.com. I have more material about the OKR cycle and best practice on OKR in, on my website. Right. Now, to wrap up our content section of the, the, the webinar, let's talk a little bit about how can you actually implement OKRs. Uh, so this is... Uh, high-level view of my blueprint for OKR rollouts, right? So let me give you a few tips on uh, roll, rolling out OKRs. The first thing you have to do, and I love this book from Simon Sinek, 
is that you have to start with why. Why are you adopting OKR in the first place? You have to have that conversation, right? Why are you doing that? What is the business impact you want to achieve? How your organization is going to improve if you succeed by OK, adopting OKR? Okay? And if your answer is, oh, we want to be more Googly, start over, right? Being more like Google is not <laughs> a proper answer. What's, what does it mean? Oh, we are moving faster, we are more aligned, we have uh, autonomous teams, we, are, uh, we have a culture of learning ex and learning experiments. Think about those outcomes you plan on achieving uh, by adopting OKR and try to measure your OKR adoption against those outcomes. And then have a conversation and course correct and iterate until you actually refine your OKR implementation to achieve those outcomes. Another very important uh, tip for uh, no care implementation is that leadership needs to show commitment and consistency. This is something that I learned from a senior executive from uh, one of my, my uh, main uh, clients, a, a global tech firm, a global tech company, and uh, he, he always he's always saying, oh, we need to show commitment as, and consistency as uh, senior leaders, because the fact is, Adopting OKR is a journey. And senior leadership has to prove that OKR is not a, the flavor of the month. Every single company has tried several different initiatives before. Some people are going to resist OKR. And some people are going to say, oh, I've seen it before. These two shall pass. So the only way to prove that OKR is not the flavor of the month is by showing commitment and consistency. You are committed to that. You're going to do this this week, and then next week again, and then next week again. And you also have to show consistency, meaning that uh, OKR has to be aligned with uh, other planning tools that you use. And you have to embed OKR, the OKR language into your management model. Uh, staff meetings, reports, town halls, one-on-ones. You have to use the OKR language as the way we talk about results, as the way we align in, in this organization. So. OKR becomes the language that we use to align. That's very important. Show commitment and consistency. And you're going to do this over and over and over again. Another very important tip, don't try to boil the ocean. It's very common for companies to try to adopt uh, OKR all at once, and it usually fails. Right. So the idea is that you can start small. And instead of starting with the wedding cake, right? Find your cupcake. So start with a small cupcake, try it, and do it a little bit bigger. Oh, find your cake, and then finally do your wedding cake, which is rolling out to every single one in the company, right? So take advantage of the, the OKR's quarterly cadence and do an incremental rollout. Start with a small group and add more people over time, right? If possible, start with senior leadership and add more people over time. When I say this, I'm, I'm meaning that don't try to have every single employee in the company uh, create OKRs uh, since the very first quarter. Try to avoid that, right? Uh, and unless you're a very small uh, group, right? Unless you're a very small organization, try to avoid that. Start with senior leadership or start with a uh, part of the organization and find your cupcake and then grow and increment over time. Finally, uh, the final tip, Develop strong OKR champions. That's crucial for uh, succeeding OKR implementation. Right? Uh, the OKR champions are the go-to persons from any OKR-related issue inside the organization. Uh, it's a part-time role. It's analogous to, to agile coaches or uh, black belt and green belt and six sigmas. So they're internal facilitators. They help uh, the company adopt OKR. And their mission is to ensure that the organization achieves continuous success with OKR. Having strong champions, their volunteers, they're willing to do that, is crucial to succeed with OKR. Right? And you add more and more champions over time, especially if you're a large organization, but it's crucial to, to have people that are, um, I think the best description of champions is that it's your army of volunteers, right? It's your volunteer army, they're going to be there to, to help OKR succeed, create alignment, uh, help teams set, set the best results. 
find and empower those uh, champions. So that was the content uh, I had to share with you today. So let's go over some of the questions, shall we? Libby, what do you think? Do you have any questions based on your experience, experience with Seven Geese? Certainly, sorry, I just had to unmute. We've got some construction happening behind me. Um, but thank you, Felipe, uh, especially for extracting some of those more useful pieces of the Measure What Matters book um, and also filling in some of those gaps in terms of tangible tips and tricks. Uh, while we compile some of these questions, actually a few key points kind of came to mind for me as you were sort of talking in terms of my own experiences. Um, and one of the first things, just as you mentioned there about implementation, uh, to your point around habits, commitment, consistency, and especially from that senior leadership level, I think this is the one thing I've seen have the most significant amount of impact. Um, and I think it's really crucial to recognize that this is actually an ongoing investment that requires effectively some change management and project management support and those tactics to give that sustainability of the approach moving forward. Uh, so like you said, uh, not a flavor of the month kind of approach. Um, actually, you know, sort of in terms of the work we do at Seven Geese, you know, we're a technology provider. So we're actually also introducing an additional layer of change uh, because the companies we work with, you know, they're not just introducing OKRs, they're also implementing performance management initiatives. They're also adding an additional piece of technology to their tech stack. And so sometimes the, the biggest mistake that I see is underestimating the degree of change that you're asking from your people. Um, so similar to your point about not boiling the ocean, uh, we often ask, how do you eat an elephant? Uh, one bite at a time. Let's plan this out. Let's map it out and, and implement that phase by phase, but ensuring that, that we have that commitment and visibility from the top. Um, one of the other pieces actually that came to mind when you were talking was around uh, building those really great OKRs. And I, I saw that you sort of linked to start with the why. Um, one of the biggest missed opportunities that I've seen in my experience has been uh, particularly at that sort of company level in terms of those objectives. Uh, when you see really generic objectives with no passion, no why, no connection to purpose. And I feel that these are really important to address at that level because sort of by the time the frontline are kind of looking at these objectives, you might have no idea where your company is going or, or what sets your company apart from anybody else. And I feel that's where you can lose a lot of power in the process. Um, we're seeing all of these papers pop up, you know, the future workforce, the current workforce needing purpose alignment. Uh, you know, they want these purpose statements. We're reading all these articles. But oftentimes we're not actually seeing any tangible application of that. How do you connect people to purpose? And I actually see OKRs as a fantastic way to do that because they're tangibly with their goals, connecting themselves and aligning to the bigger picture of the company and seeing how that progress actually moves their company forward. Um, some of the companies I've actually partnered with, you know, I walk in and I, I kind of do a little bit of an audit perhaps of those company level objectives and, and we'll see things uh, similar to some of the examples actually you brought up, um, but things like increased profitability or increased operational efficiencies or something really generic and bland. And certainly as an individual contributor, it, it doesn't really make me want to jump out of bed and set myself a really stretchy, committed quarterly goal of any kind. Um, so this is sort of a, a big opportunity I see companies really doing if they want to iterate or mature their OKR process. Um, so they were just yeah, a few. That... Yeah, sorry, go on. No, go ahead. Maybe you could go to some of the questions from the attendees. Absolutely. So we've had a few come through and I mentioned, uh, well, you mentioned here when you talked a bit about blueprint for implementation. So what advice would you give companies if they're considering whether they're ready or whether OKRs are the right approach for them to take? You know, what steps should they take to determine this prior to actually bringing in OKRs? I think that the, 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 the best thing is I would have the senior leadership team try it for a quarter. Right. Uh, you don't have to, one thing to understand is that you don't have to adapt every single practice in OKR, right? I call it building blocks. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a great quote from my friend and colleague, uh, Dan Montgomery. He says that you shouldn't imitate Google. Not even Google imitates Google. <laughs> uh, Google <laughs> uses OKR in different ways inside the company, right? So you don't mm -hmm. have to try to copy Google video or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, try to think, hey, those things make sense. And let's try to do that in a pilot so you can try that. There are several aspects, several of the OKR building blocks make sense for any company in the world. Focusing on outcomes, having regular conversations around value, regularly tracking your OKRs, uh, 
aligning the organization around the outcomes you want to achieve, uh, ex having conversations to explain the strategy for the employees, those make sense in any type of business, right? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe your business doesn't move as fast as, uh, as uh, Silicon Valley, okay. Maybe you don't need a quarterly OKR, mm -hmm. I don't know. Maybe you're not ready for dealing with ambitious goals, okay. But some of the core conversations are very, very important. Right. And again, don't imitate Google, not even Google imitates Google. Right. So uh, I think the, I would definitely start with the senior leadership team and see what works. Maybe they find they will find, hey, almost everything works. We can do that. Right. Yep, absolutely. And I see this a lot where people are going, Google did it this way, but perhaps that doesn't match your company culture or your company rhythms or what makes sense for your business. So that makes perfect sense. Another question that's come through is, should we be assigning individual KRs to people? I often hear people wanting to assign KRs, and I'm not sure if this is best practice. Uh, it's not. Uh, it depends. The answer is it depends, right? Uh, for example, there are companies such as Twitter and Spotify that have almost uh, banned, uh, stopped using individual OKRs. Because the thing is, a good OKR is not a to-do list, right? An OKR is about delivering value, imagine the outcomes you want to achieve. And if you think about the structure of modern organizations today, many, uh, many employees work in a team-based environment, right? Where mm -hmm. the outcomes are shared within the team. If you think about a cross-functional product team, if you think about a team in engineering using agile uh, frameworks, in those teams I have a group of individuals working together toward the same outcome. In that scenario, I can only use a uh, team level OKR. Otherwise, I will be making people write activities, right? Because the outcome by definition is at the team level. Under that, underneath that, I only have uh, a set of activities, right? So don't do that if that's the case. Uh, another example, uh, when I work with larger enterprises, they have a, a branding team, for example. And usually in that scenario, I have a group of individuals working in, to improve the brand perception, improve brand awareness, the brand attributes, but each individual doesn't have an individual outcome, right? They, the metrics are at the team level. Again, I should stop at, at team uh, level OKRs. Uh, there are some uh, co contexts where I have an, uh, an individual outcome. I don't know, recruiting. It's very common for recruiters to have um, the, the, the position they are working with, with so they can measure time to fill things like that. So individual OKRs, only work if I have individual metrics, individual outcomes, okay? But I strongly recommend starting with team level only, right? Because it's simpler, right? And then evolve over time. You don't have to have individual OKRs for every single in the company. In fact, I don't I recommend against that. Mm -hmm. uh, particularly in the first phases of implementation, I guess, when you're first figuring out the rhythm of the company and how that works. Um, so yeah. Look, Another question we have come through, uh, is it a recommendation that levels of OKRs in an organization correspond to the organizational levels? Are there cases where OKRs are not directly mapping to the organizational units, but are rather defined around initiatives? Oh, well, definitely, that's a great question. Uh, I usually recommend uh, reducing the number of layers from uh, your OKRs, right? Because the, the traditional approach, the traditional cascading approach is Oh, we have CO goals, and then we have uh, VP goals, and director, and manager, et cetera. Right? So each layer in the, the uh, structure has the OKRs. The problem is that it takes too long, because every time you add a new layer, I have to wait until the, the layer above creates the OKR, so it takes too long. Right? Mm -hmm. So I usually recommend trying to have the few layers as possible. If you have a flatter structure, you can have company-level OKRs, and uh, team level cares only, two levels, right? As you start to scale, you can add more layers. Right? But definitely, you can reduce the number of, of uh, layers. And then the managers, they help the team set the OKRs and help the, the, the team achieve the OKRs. And also, we can create uh, shared OKRs that are cross-functional. Uh, the question is about initiatives. You can uh, create uh, shared OKRs around uh, business processes, uh, value streams, uh, strategic teams, for example, you create, can create a, a strategic uh, team around customer satisfaction, and then you can create a cross-functional OKR for that. Definitely, you don't need to follow the org structure to set your OKRs. 
Fantastic. And look, we've had a, a question come through. This is a very common one that I hear quite frequently in our sessions. What is the difference between OKRs and traditional KPIs? Okay, great, very common question. Uh, the first thing is that uh, KPI is a word that's is a term that's so overused that it lost its meaning. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, for some people, uh, KPI means metric. So any metric is a KPI. For some people, KPIs means, oh, the metrics we currently track. And for some, KPI means, oh, the way we use uh, metrics, so it's tied to compensation, et cetera. So the answer is, it depends on what you mean by KPI. Mm -hmm. So first of all, if you think that uh, KPI is synonym to metric, yeah, good metrics can be your key result. So good KPIs will be part of your OKRs, right? The idea in, in OKRs is that, you look at every single metric in the company and you select the five or ten that really matter, right? I select a very small set that really matter. So those are your uh, OKRs. So when people uh, ask me about KPIs, I usually tell them, don't forget about the K. Because the K means key, right? <laughs> That's good. It means a few. It means the most important ones. So I often see managers saying, oh, I have 50 KPIs on my unit. No, you don't have 50. It's impossible. Because it, by definition, they're not key, right? You have 50 metrics. What are the five key ones? Right? So that's the very first conversation you need to have, right? Uh, OKRs are, by definition, a small set that really matters. It's not about measuring every single thing you do in the company. Now, we've had a, a pretty tricky question come through now, which uh, is something that I get asked a lot as well. Um, but how do you handle skeptics who claim the better we do OKRs, the worse we do Agile? I don't think I understood the question. Um, the, the thing is that usually when people um, have struggled um, mer merging OKR and Agile is because they're using OKR to track activities, right? And Agile frameworks at, at, at the core, an Agile framework is about uh, delivering stuff, right? So an engineer will complain, hey, I have this activity on my backlog or on my roadmap. Why do I need to put this same activity in my OKR? Because it's redundant, right? And by the way, the engineers are correct. So if we think about the two buckets, Agile frameworks are about how you deliver the things on the second bucket, the activities bucket, and the OKRs in the first bucket. The OKRs are how you choose your backlog, how you prioritize your activities, right? So they definitely help uh, teams using Agile frameworks, okay? So when I see this question, it's often because they misunderstood the, how to use OKR properly, and that creates confusion. Uh, if you want to know more about that, go to my website, again, philippecastro.com. There's a whole section about OKR and Agile, right? So uh, probably we can cover more there, right? Fantastic, and I actually found that really useful as well for explaining that connection between the two, um, because this is a question that comes up a lot in terms of how OKRs and Agile fit in together. Um, so we have another question. Uh, we are a large company with multiple large organizations. What level of the organization do you see as the champions you were talking about? Oh, great question. Uh, usually uh, the champions, uh, they have to have a mix of seniority and bandwidth, right? So I can have more senior uh, OKR champions uh, as long as they have the bandwidth, right? So if you're talking about a, a large scale, uh, a, a, an enterprise scale organization, I definitely see uh, directors as champions. I definitely see uh, VPs uh, as, as champions, right? It's common. Uh, if you're talking about a, a smaller, I don't know, 100, 100 200 people, I often see uh, more junior uh, uh, champions because they need, they need the bandwidth to help mm -hmm. others. So you have to balance this seniority with, with bandwidth, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And a smaller company, it's very hard to get a VP to be uh, 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 the champion, right? Because there's no benefit for that. As you scale uh, your uh, implementation, some of the best champions I've, I've worked with are very senior, but they have the bandwidth for that because the organization made a decision of making that a priority, right? So it's a mixture of uh, uh, 
So it's common to have more senior people, more junior people with more bandwidth working side by side as champions. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Um, so one of the additional questions we've just had come through would be, how do you ensure that OKRs don't feel tacked onto our daily tasks and routines? It's common feedback that we get during implementation that OKRs are typically seen as an added responsibility or an added duty. Um, yes, uh, the thing is, um, the example I, I, I always like to give is, think about the goals in your personal life. Okay? I don't know, maybe you want to save money for a trip, maybe you want to, to get fit, maybe you want to learn a new language, or you want to be more your family and friends, whatever goals you have in your life. Right? You have those goals, right? But you also have to buy groceries. Unless you buy groceries, you starve and die. You need groceries. <laughs> but you can't let buying groceries is stay between you and your goals, right? So what you do is, if buying groceries is taking so much of your life that it's preventing you to, I don't know, see your family, you reinvent how you buy groceries, right? You buy closer to your home, you order online, you find a way to reinvent that task, that day-to-day -day task, so you have more time for yourself and your goals. It's the same thing with OKR. OKR, by definition, is what you decided it's not your boss decision, it's your decision in a conversation with your, with your boss, a bi-directional conversation, that you decided that's the most important thing. So yes, that's more important than spending time buying groceries. So I have to reinvent how I buy groceries, right? So if you don't have time for, for doing no OKRs, uh, maybe you should reinvent how you work, change your daily priorities, etc. What's very important is that the amount of time you'll be able to uh, focus on your OKRs, changes a lot depending on your role and your context. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're doing, a, a, if you have a very process, procedural work, uh, maybe you have 10% of your time for doing OKRs, maybe 20%. Maybe if you work in a pro product team, the de developing a new product is the opposite. Maybe 80% of your time will be dedicated to OKRs and 20% for day-to-day -day stuff. It changes a lot, right? But you, since you define OKRs as the most important thing, you have to find enough time. You have to make time for that. Right? So you have to reinvent how you do the other stuff uh, to avoid preventing you to achieve your, your goals. Fantastic. And look, Felipe, we've just approached the hour now, um, and we have had a whole wealth of questions coming through, um, which unfortunately we're not going to have time to address today, um, but we will do our best to follow these up. So Felipe and I will connect around answering some of these other questions that have come through, um, and we will uh, feed that back to all of those that have attended. But Felipe, thank you so much for your time today um, and for your open candor around the book, uh, practical tips and tricks, and all of those answers. I particularly enjoyed the analogies. They're really useful for conceptually understanding some of those really uh, critical points. So thank you so much. Thanks, Libby. Thanks, uh, Samigit, for having me. having me. Thanks for all the attendees for joining us. And let's talk again. Connect with Thanks. me at flipcap.com, okay? Fantastic. Thank you, everybody.